The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Thank you, Leslie. Ooh, that's loud. Thanks. So I hope that by now, should I move this down some? That's super loud. Uh, you've had a chance to come by the booth uh, and check out opensource.com, but if you had one, I'll take a minute to tell you about what it is and even more specifically what it isn't. So Red Hat launched opensource.com about a year and a half ago. And whenever I try to describe it to new people, they say, oh, so it's like SourceForge, right? I can upload my software. And I say, no, it's not like SourceForge. And they say, well, is it like OpenHatch, where maybe I could find a project? And I say, nope, it's not like OpenHatch. Well, maybe it's OS Alt. You can tell me what software to use. And I say, nope, it's not like OS Alt at all. So opensource.com is completely unrelated to technology. Sorry. And uh, what we talk about instead is how all the things that make open source work really well as a software development model, how those can be applied in other ways. And we split the content into what we call channels, business, education, government, law, life, and health, and talk about how open source principles affect all of those areas. And this is a now kind of older screenshot of the site, but you can see we've also added now the health channel across that blue bar. One of the things that we use opensource.com for is to try to explain what open source means to someone who's coming at it uh, completely new. If you have no idea what open source software is, how would you describe it to someone? And so for a lot of people, the first thing they think of when they think of this collaboration kind of effort is a wiki. And Lostpedia is a really great example of one outside of Wikipedia where people who are all fans of this show spent exorbitant amounts of time compiling all of this information about the show. And as, like, this is an example. I pulled up this page because as far as I know, this map shows up for like 10 seconds in one episode. And yet people dragged out all this information to put it together so you can find out what the map maps to. And I was really grateful because that meant that I didn't have to try to figure it out. But then these people new to open source say, sometimes that whole collaboration thing doesn't really work out. Like, say, when Stephen Colbert edited Wikipedia to say that Conan O'Brien liked to club sea turtles with canoe paddles, and it got accepted, and he showed that on the show. And so at opensource.com, we give you vast ways to talk about how all of these principles are working outside of technology. And the reason I started talking about these principles, and not necessarily just these five, but a lot more, is because we originally were talking about the open source way as a collective term for all of these. But that's about as effective as referring to intellectual property to talk about vastly different terms like copyright and patents and trademarks. It works as a collective term, but it's not entirely accurate and it's sometimes misleading. And so I found that when I was talking about the open source way, people immediately assumed I was talking about software. So instead I started talking about these principles instead. And so that's how I'm gonna tell you a few stories today. And I hope that at least one of the stories interests you and maybe by the end you'll be ready to tell me your own stories that we can post on the site. So first we'll talk about some community projects. The first is Apertus. Apertus is an, a camera. It's an offshoot of the Elfil, which is an open hardware camera for scientific applications. It's been used for uh, the Google Books and Google Street View projects and for cool things like under IC exploration in the Arctic. And uh, so the people who knew about this camera and were more interested in cinema applications said, we really like to have something like this because as cameras became uh, more digital, they also became more proprietary because that was a way to make them more expensive. You could lock down little bits inside the camera and nobody could get to them. 
So through this project, this is another shot taken with the Aphrodis, they were able to get this open hardware camera down to, uh, I believe, about $700. Uh, hacker spaces, uh, a very fundamental example of the way communities function. And uh, while a lot of you, if you're, how many people have a hacker space in your community that you know about? A lot of the people you find there probably into Linux, into open source, know about that. But there are also a good number of them where it's just people who like to work on cool projects. But those are people who are perfect for introducing to open source software and more of these principles. And these pictures are from Seabase in Berlin, which is one of the oldest hacker spaces, and it's, it's my favorite, because there's this great myth that goes along with it. This is uh, the spire that comes out of it. And the story goes that there is a space station that crashed while exiting a, a time warp, crashed in Berlin. This is the antenna of the space station. Uh, and there are seven circles, and there are little bits of the technology, I think, sprinkled all over Berlin. There's this whole mythology around it, and I think that just makes it that much cooler as a hacker space. Next up, gaming. How many gamers are here? Do you game in Linux? So a lot of people think, well, all I can really do is, is Unreal, and that was 2004, and that's kind of a long time ago, which is okay, it's still cool, and there's a lot of stuff that came out of it. World of Goo is my favorite Linux-ready game, and it's, even, it's great for kids. If you haven't played World of Goo, it's a physics-based game and not our physics, but the physics of goo. And you have these little things called goo balls and you have to connect them to, to reach a new point. When World of Goo was initially Mac and Windows only, when they put the Linux version up, within two days, it was almost 5% of their downloads and they had higher downloads on the day they launched Linux than they ever had in the history of the game, which I think is, is evidence enough that people are ready for gaming in Linux. And if that wasn't, on uh, April Fool's Day this year, I posted an article on opensource.com called Steam for Linux Confirmed, which is this uh, big gaming thing that people have been waiting for on Linux for a long time, and a lot of people are really mad at me for posting that. The Humble Bundles are this super cool little package. They, I think they've done three of them now, where they put together about $50 worth of games and put it out there and go with a pay-what-you-will model. It's all DRM free and it benefits the EFF and Child's Play, which is this great charity for kids. Uh, what I think is a fun fact about the Humble Bundles, this is a screenshot from the last one, which was called the Humble Frozen Byte Bundle. The average Linux user paid almost $12, the Windows users, four. Next principle, sharing. Uh, I'm going to show you a quick video. I'm gonna try to make this whole sound thing work from uh, a story we talked about where some kids are going to high school online, essentially. Can you hear that? Well, you are witnessing one of the very first orientation sessions on the Open High School of Utah. They're meeting the counselor and checking their schedules. They're getting their student pictures taken. They're signing in and doing their forms and their fees. We've walked them through how to sign into their classes so that next Monday they'll open up those computers and have everything that they need to be able to be successful students at the Open High School of Utah. Um, I'm Rachel, and I chose coming to Open High School because there would be a lot of flexibility and a lot of interaction with teachers. So it was different from what else was out there, and I just thought it would be a good fit, and it is. So I started skating when I was eight, and now I just like travel for like contests. The best part's been just like being able to travel and skate without having like a hassle of school and just take it with me. My older daughter went to it last year, and she's in China this year working in an orphanage, and she was able to take her computer with her and do her classes in China. So that's awesome. So the first thing that they do is just gather content. There is so much OER out there. Once they have that gathered, then they go through it and they start aligning it to the state standard. Then they start beefing it up and adding in the screencasts and 
We use Skype and Jing and Camtasia and VoiceThread and SlideRocket and Blabberize, and it's like a foreign language, all of the tech tools that we're able to use. But the thing that I really like is being, having it more interactive and being able to have math applets on your thing where they're actually able to play math games and they're actually able to see things happening, which you couldn't see in a textbook. With the open source content, you can modify it to meet your own students' needs. So when I found uh, some stuff, I tried it in my class, it didn't work, threw it out, tried something else that I found, and it worked. And so that's what I love about open source and not having a textbook is that you can't just tear out that chapter in the textbook, but with open source you can. Now, one of the first things a teacher will go to to look at things is obviously her grade book. In a grade book, you can actually go to individual assignments, and so I'm going to take a look at this, this test right here. And we cannot just look at grades, but we can look at scores on individual questions. And then I can take a look at all these different items over here to give me more information to try to decide, was it a valid question? Do I need to examine the content? that the students learn the question from? Do I need to look at the question and rewrite it? So all of these different levels of data and data analysis are available to our teachers that really aren't available to a teacher in a brick and mortar unless they have a program like this that is doing the math for them. I love bricks and mortar schools, so I'm still, you know, I know they're trying, but it was a lot harder. We always talked about wanting to make it data driven, but it was hard when you're correcting all these paper tests to be able to go through and actually analyze each question and what each question was, whereas here it's at our fingertips. Here, I'll go ahead and stop there. That keeps going for a little while longer. Uh, but what I think is great about this, I would have loved the opportunity in high school to uh, get my work done in the amount of time that it took me to do the work and then have the rest of the time to do whatever was important to me, like the girl working in the orphanages or the kid who's doing competitive skateboarding. I think that's, uh, that's really awesome. Uh, next up, we have in the, the music industry, and if you have Everybody Wants to Rule the World stuck in your head for the rest of the night, I totally take the blame. Uh, on the left, we have Kurt Smith, who was half of Cheers for Fears, responsible for said song. He is doing some new collaborations and still working with Cheers for Fears, but what's great about him, all his new stuff he's releasing with Creative Commons licenses. And he has this wonderful justification for it, where he talks about how labels hampered his ability to collaborate with other people. And he says, I could spend all my time protecting copyright against probably unintended infringement. It, there aren't that many people out there who just personally hate Tears for Fears and want to steal all my stuff. I could spend all that time making new music instead. And so that's what I choose to do. And then Brad Sucks is another musician who licenses everything uh, Creative Commons. If you've never heard of him, you've probably heard his sounds in Pigeon. He made all those sounds. And uh, he's played with uh, Jonathan Coulton and Paul and Storm and some other super nerdy people like that. So now it's pop quiz. Oh, no, we have another video, sorry. I got my notes in the wrong order. Do you know what a RepRap is? Or a MakerBot? So MakerBot Industries makes an affordable open source 3D printer. This is a machine that can make things for you. And basically you put it together, it comes as a kit, and when you've got it, you're done, you have a 3D printer that can sit on your desktop, and you send it, uh, you have an STL file for an object, and then you slice it up, uh, in a program called ScheneForge, totally open source. Use a program called Replicator G, which we made up, which takes the G code, which is machine language, sends it to the machine, and whatever idea you had for a 3D object gets made in the 3D printer. Up to about that size. We're obsessed with open source, and that for a few reasons. One, we found a lot of inspiration from the whole open source software community. We know that if we make it open source, and we let everybody who wants one of these things also have all the designs, all the plans, all the code, all the electronics, eagle files, all the diagrams for the circuit boards, that if they want to make modifications to it, it makes it really easy. You want to hack it and put a different kind of extruder on it, all the, all the support is there for you to be able to do whatever you want with it. Right, so we have a few people we're making this for. We want, we're making it for architects, engineers, designers, um, and then like our, um, people who are in school, whether you're a professor or you are in some sort of institution where you want a way to make objects really fast and cheap. Um, but then we're also making it for people who want to live in the future. We were promised flying cars. We were promised hoverboards. We were promised uh, space colonies. We were promised all these magical things in the future, including a machine that would make things for you, whatever you wanted. 
Well, we can't really do anything about flying cars yet, but we can. We've we've come up with a platform for three for for a kit that you can get and build your own 3D printer. So open video conference. So I was one of I was one of the early video bloggers. It was me and about 20 other people, and that was the time where like before YouTube, before Blip, before Vimeo, before all these things, we were all just sharing our lives online, giving tours of our houses, telling personal stories, crying, and we were watching everything because there were only 20 people doing it. And it was really exciting, and a lot of my friends from, from those days are here because we're all obsessed with this idea of sharing, this idea of sharing our lives and sharing things with people. And open video, it might seem like it's all about codecs, but it's actually about something really personal, sharing your life and sharing, share, with video, sharing really special things. Her mother was right. It's better to share. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's a culture of sharing. This is the most powerful, interesting thing in the world right now, this culture of sharing. You know, back in the day, you know, the hippies had free love. In the 80s, they had electronic music. Right now, we have a culture of sharing that's just rocking the world. Like, the old ways can't even figure this out because they're like, they don't understand it at all. But, like... As soon as you share something and somebody else does something with it, you get this feeling of pride. It's like fixing a bicycle or something like this. Somebody is like built on something you've done and it's just this magical feeling. And as soon as you have that magical feeling, you're like sharing, it's the future, I'm in. And for me, ever since those early days of video blogging, I've just given everything to the internet. Everything I've done, up on the internet. I love that guy. That's the end. Makerbot.com, he says. There's the Darth Vader head. It is super cool. If uh, That's the next question, but I'll finish talking about the Makerbot. If you've never seen one, they're super cool. And there are a couple of variations on these 3D printers now, the RepRap and some others. And they kind of have a reputation for being self-replicating. And so if you find somebody with one, you just print the parts for the next one, and then you print the parts for the next one. And hackerspaces tend to develop large collections of them and don't know what to do with them. So if you would like one, you just find your local hackerspace. There's a great one, if you happen to be in North Carolina, there's a great one in Winston-Salem where they are happy to print you parts to build your own. And it's not that hard. It's kind of fun. So as we're talking about sharing, I like that guy. He's like the poster boy for sharing. How many things do you en think entered the public domain this year? Throw out some numbers. A million. That would be awesome. Zero. Who said zero? You, you already knew that. So we are currently in the United States in what we call the public domain black hole. Because nothing new is going to enter the public domain in the United States until 2019 because of ridiculous changes in copyright law over the years. When copyright was conceived of, it was 14 years, and then you had a chance to renew for another 14, and that was it. If you wanted more copyright after that, sorry. Uh, and even a, as late as the 80s, uh, before things really changed dramatically, 85% of the authors didn't renew. And so that means that under the 28-year rules, the 14 plus 14, 93% of the books written in 1982 would have entered the public domain this year. But they didn't. Uh, the reason I say the mouse will keep you on copyright forever is because every time Mickey Mouse is about to expire, we get a little more copyright. And so uh, this is a few things that did not enter the, the public domain this year. And I am certain that you can find at least one thing on there that you would have liked to have seen remixed or freely available on Project Gutenberg or otherwise available to you. In the healthcare field, there are several websites now that are taking uh, collaborative health information, things that people are willing to share about their own health conditions, and using them to reach new results. Either personally, where you've met a group of people and say, wow, all you guys started having foot pain at the same time, so in a month I can expect foot pain, things like that, to cure together which used all of this aggregate data to make a link that had only been speculated on before between asthma and infertility. And so a lot of people over the years had said that they thought that there was a connection. Traditional research hadn't been able to prove it, but all of this aggregate data from people willing to share their information on Cure Together 
proved the link. And if you're a statistical sort of person, here's the statistical information. They also proved a link to endometriosis, which has a high relationship known with infertility. Uh, there's another site that does some similar work called Patients Like Me. And so if you're interested in that, I highly recommend checking out the health channel on opensource.com. You can go to opensource.com slash health. And we've been talking about this a lot more about whether you're willing to share your information. Are you willing to tell the whole world? Anonymously, of course. Uh, I, I have AIDS. I have been pregnant 12 times and miscarried eight of them. What are you willing to, to share and who are you willing to share it with? Your doctor, your family, your friends, a whole bunch of strangers across the internet. Uh, I just heard there was a big health conference about three days ago and I heard that Aetna, the insurance company, is trying to transition to this uh, more patient-friendly model. They had some very markety word for it, uh, but not so focused on the profitability of insurance. And they have a million customers already sharing their aggregate data like this with Aetna, and they're doing a lot of great stuff with it. Also from that, that same conference, so I've, I've only known about this for about three days, and I'm so excited I want to tell everybody I've, I've met about it. It's, uh, it's localhealthdata.org, you can go to it, and it's this awesome little tool called Ozioma, which is a Nigerian word for good news. And the, the problem they were trying to address was a lack of media coverage of particularly cancer, although that's not the only kind of information you can look up, uh, and particularly for minorities, which again is not the only kind of information you can look up. But what you do is you drill th down through this data tab and you can sort for the type of information you're looking for on the type of condition, sort by ethnicity, by sex, by age, and immediately add these little clips of information to your, your clipboard. And then if you're a journalist, there's another tab where you can go and you can paste in your article and immediately send over these little clips of information. And you can do the same thing with charts and here's an image search where you can look for the type of images you're looking for. And they've increased uh, local health coverage of 15% uh, so far, uh, just by having this tool available for newspapers who are willing to use it. And so compiling this amount of information, I decided to use Spartanburg since that's where we are, uh, pretending I'm writing a story about Spartanburg County and African American women over 50. This whole thing took me maybe three minutes to search down for and compile, and that was mostly because the internet here is slow. So again, that was localhealthdata.org if you want to go play with it. Uh, it won the recent uh, Health 2.0 and National Cancer Institute's Developer Challenge. It's pretty cool. Moving down our list of principles onto transparency, which I almost think of as a synonym for openness, so it's a good catch-all. You know, so a lot of these stories could fall into any of these categories. I'm a big fan of, of NASA. I'm headed down to the last shuttle launch in a few weeks, and they've been doing a ton with this NASA open government plan lately, and they really are leading the charge uh, under the Obama administration for the call for open data and what you can do with open data. And if you had told me six months ago that I would happily read a 172-page government report, I would have thought you were insane. And yet that's exactly what I did when they published the open government plan. It reported on 150 milestones uh, and 19 open government projects, a lot of them related to open source software. And each one of those reports uh, talks about how they're doing on collaboration, transparency, and participation. And there's a report on everything from how they're handling Freedom of Information Act requests to declassifying data that has been held secret to how they're going to involve the public in NASA's future. The word crowdsourcing comes up a lot. And NASA's facing a lot of problems right now. You know, they have no money anymore, essentially. And so they're relying a lot on what the public's going to be able to offer them going forward. This is just a little tiny piece of a really long and cool infographic. And I'll post all the links to this later on opensource.com if you want to go look everything up. Speaking of government, does anybody know what this is, these are pictures of? This is the dome over the Reichstag in Berlin. And so, as I'm sure you all remember from history class, the German government has been through some turmoil over the years, say. Uh, and the Reichstag was constructed uh, in the late 1890s. In 1916, there was an inscription that I will not attempt to say in German because my German is terrible, but it meant to the German people which if you think in the context of German history is kind of interesting. Then in 1999, they built this dome over the, the building. And so there are so many cool things about this. This whole part down here looks down into parliament. And the idea was that the people would always be able to look down over the government and see what they were doing so that history would never repeat itself. 
And there are a lot of other fun facts. That's, that's the transparency and government part. But uh, if you'd like to read more about this, particularly if you like architecture, these paths where you can walk up all the way around the dome, you don't come down the same path. They're, they're intertwined, and so you come down a different one. And then there's this cool sunshade, so that if you happen to be a member of parliament, you don't have the sun glaring in your eyes all day. Also over in Europe, this is Tidy Street, a little, a little residential lane in Brighton in the UK. And they were aware that uh, consumers who are informed of their electricity usage tend to lower it. But there's different information about how I give you the data and what you know about how your data compares to anyone else's data. And so they said, well, let's just make it public. And so every day, they have a local graffiti artist updating the street with the street's electricity usage data. And they have lowered their energy use 15% in about two weeks. Because <laughs> every morning you walk out and you know exactly what everybody did last night. But they're doing it in aggregate. It's the neighborhood's data. It's not your window doesn't show your neighbors that you left the lights on all night. It's how you're all doing together. This is, uh, this is, I call it the most compelling story that I've heard in the last year and a half of doing opensource.com as to why openness and even open source software is important. And I also always say that I feel like I'm stealing somebody else's story because I heard it at LinuxCon last year. Uh, but I feel like it's that important. I just want to keep telling her story. Karen Sandler from the Software Freedom Law Center found out that she needed a pacemaker. She was in danger of sudden cardiac death. And so she went to the pacemaker company and said, could I see the source code that's going to save my life? And raise your hand if you think they said yes. <laughs> and so she said, I'll be happy to sign an NDA, but seriously, if you're implanting source code in my chest, I would like to see it. And they said no. And so the uh, Medical Device Security Center conducted a, a study on implanted medical devices and found that with some really complicated hardware, like say a PC and an antenna, they could easily access your implanted device and that it was transmitting your patient data unencrypted. And they could see your name and your information and maybe even say, induce ventricular fibrillation <laughs> and kill you. So if open source software is not important to save your life, I don't know when it is. Furthermore, there is case precedent, Rigel versus Medtronic, that prevents patients from challenging the effectiveness or safety of a device that the FDA has already approved. So if you're not really okay with this, your choices are not have a pacemaker and die, or have a pacemaker, and let's admit it, the chances of someone hacking into your pacemaker and killing you are low, and yet exist, and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, and she has written an extensive paper called Killed by Code, appropriately enough, uh, about the entire situation. Perk it up a little with some meritocracy. And the military, because nobody ever dies there. Uh, this is General Hugh Shelton, who is now also the chairman of the board for Red Hat. Uh, and I have to admit that when I heard that our new chairman of the board was the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I thought, exactly what does a 40-year military man have to do with Red Hat? I didn't, I didn't get it at all. And fortunately, I was lucky enough to have the chance. We have a series of webcasts, and he did one with us about his book, which came out last October. And when my boss said, would you like to read this 500-page autobiography of a military man, and I have absolutely no military connection history in my family at all, I was like, yeah, okay, for the webcast, I'll read it. It was fascinating. I couldn't stop reading it. And I am just not a military history kind of person at all. And so to get to the point, uh, meritocracy in the military, the military really is our oldest form of meritocracy. And it's what we rely on for open source communities to function. And so in our webcast, which we all have recorded, you can go listen to him, he talks about not just meritocracy, but all of the principles of the open source way and how they fit into his career with the military over the last 40 years going all the way back to uh, when he was a young army man in Vietnam. And they didn't have sophisticated software to figure out where the enemy was, where they should attack, what they should do. And his boss said, here's a massive pile of data. Come back to me in the morning and tell me what to do. And so he and a colleague sat down. And, and when you hear the story, you're going to think, well, that seems obvious. And yet it's the 60s, and it didn't really seem that obvious. They took all the data and mapped the information they had about various enemy problems and the areas, and then they stacked them on top of each other. And they had a little quarter-sized area. 
that highlighted on every transparency. And they showed up at the meeting the next morning and said, here, this is where I think we should uh, target. And so now they've developed software that does exactly what the two of them did with transparencies and markers back in Vietnam. Today we call that rapid prototyping, which we'll get to in a minute. He also, I, I was trying to find another clip to show you uh, where he was on The Daily Show, and he talks about uh, how at one of his first meetings with President Clinton's cabinet, he was asked if we could find justification for war in Iraq by perhaps flying an American plane really low so that they could shoot it down. And would he be okay with that? And he said, yes, I think that is an excellent idea. Just as soon as you get trained to fly that plane. I suddenly developed a lot more respect for having the military man in charge of our board of directors. Everybody know about Kickstarter? Raise your hand, Kickstarter. So, if not, Kickstarter is a great way for particularly creative projects to raise funds. And these are uh, the top four fundraiser, fundraisers that have used Kickstarter. Diaspora was the project that infamously attempted to bring down Facebook. And uh, is anybody using Diaspora? Oh, OK. Maybe we can be friends. I haven't logged in in a few months. That's kind of how it, it worked out. But Diaspora said, we need a little cash to get this thing going, and suddenly had $200,000. The Glyph was a little iPhone tripod. They're actually working on their second project now. They asked for, uh, I think, about $15,000 and got $150,000. Uh, Muse Open uh, was to, to make music good for the public, or something along those lines. And Punk Mathematics was a punk rock math book, which is just kind of fun. But uh, th yeah, they all are doing very well with the crowdsourced fundraising model, I have to say. And a lot of people are. Just even, uh, it, you don't have to raise $200,000. You can raise $5,000 for the thing you think is great. And one of the first stories I wrote for opensource.com was about somebody who previously had written for some of the mainstream role-playing game companies. And uh, he kind of went a little rogue, I guess. And he, he calls it ransoming. He puts his books up and says, if I get enough money on Kickstarter, then I'll release them with a Creative Commons license. And so then there's even this third level of benefit where enough people said, yes, we're willing to pay for this. And because we're willing to pay for it, everyone else can have it for free, which is a, a super cool use of Kickstarter. Promised rapid prototyping, here it is. This is a perhaps apocryphal story, but a good one nevertheless, as the apocryphal ones often are about a university campus that laid out their sidewalks and then everybody didn't use them. They walked off on their own path and killed all the grass. And so there are several places that in real life, completely non-apocryphal stories, have started using what are called desire lines, where they simply put down the grass and not the sidewalks and let people form their own paths. And then that's where they build the sidewalks, which is a heck of a lot better way to run any project. You figure out what the people need and where they're going and then you give them what they need, not what you want them to have. It's a connection to all of your projects here. This is a, a company called Design That Matters, and this is a picture of a little baby incubator. And uh, nearly two million babies die every year just because they aren't kept warm in their first month of life. Two million babies die before they're a month old just because they were too cold. That's it, all they needed was to be kept warm. And so these guys got together, some super smart people, and said, we can solve this problem. They went to the hospitals and looked around. And there were incubators. There were plenty of them. And, and this is mostly in India and other poorer Asian countries. And they found plenty of incubators in French, which none of the nurses spoke, or that were broken except for a piece that would cost a nickel in the US, but there was no way to obtain in India, or junked incubators behind the, the hospital that nobody knew how to repair. So they looked around and said, what, what would be the right way to solve this? Well, there's not a supply line for incubator parts, but there is a supply line for car parts. So what if we could build an incubator with car parts? And so now, babies alive, nurses fixing incubators. It's a match made in heaven. Uh, he, they actually have several other projects, too. I'm trying to get him to write some more stories, so keep an eye on the site. Uh, you've probably heard of OpenStreetMap as well by now, but this, I think, is the greatest testament to its success. After the earthquake in Haiti, there was a problem getting supplies uh, to people who needed them and getting people who needed to be in hospital beds to hospital beds, because this is what the map looks like. And this is what the map looked like because it's not profitable to spend a lot of money mapping poor places. So there simply wasn't available data. 
OpenStreetMap got together and very quickly turned this into that. And then over that, they laid uh, the places where the, the different icons are probably hard to read, but they represented where you could find hospital beds, places that still had medicine, places that didn't have anything to help. And so this is what helped the first responders get what they needed. And so going back to this map, this is what OpenStreetMap did. Oh, oh, I cut it out. There it is. This is the Google map today of the same area. So that's what the OpenStreetMap people can do. That's what Google can do. And so some people say, but we do talk about software on the site. Because I always say, we're not talking about software. I get a lot of people who, who see opensource.com and they want to tell me about their cool project. And I say, I don't talk about software. And then they read the site and they say, but you do talk about software. And so I have to explain why. It usually comes down to patents. We end up talking about software patents a lot. And then that reaches out into other types of patents. And a few months ago, a uh, federal district court in New York held invalid patents held by Myriad Genetics for genes, for the breast cancer genes, and testing for them. And the result of one company holding the patents on those genes was that women who needed the testing for those genes had to pay a lot of money and wait a lot longer than, sh than they should. Treatments were being delayed. And then again, you're talking about someone holding too much information being responsible for someone possibly dying. And so fortunately, the uh, District Court of New York did the right thing and said that you can't patent genes, that's not cool. Uh, and they actually, the way that this connected back in particular to the site was that they used the uh, precedent set by Bilski, which a lot of people had looked to for the future of software patents, although it actually was about business method patents. It all comes back around sooner or later. This is a, a page uh, also in our legal realm of a comic book that was supposed to come out this spring, but now we're in the summer, and so I'm still waiting. Uh, but it's being put together by the, the Center for the Public Domain at Duke University, and it's called Theft, A History of Music. And it's the second book that they've done like this. The first one was called Bound by Copyright. And so they've taken these really difficult legal concepts that a lot of people get really, really wrong and put them in comic book form, and they're really fun to read. And unfortunately, I suspect the reason this one is delayed is because the really great guy who was the artist on these died about a month ago. But there, there are so many good stories in here that start with copyright going back to Plato, who said, uh, and I have to read this because I have to get the Plato quote right, any musical innovation is full of danger in the whole state and ought to be prohibited. So we had remix problems going back to Plato. It didn't start with YouTube. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that I learned from this that was really interesting was about musical sampling. And the case precedent set, precedent set by NWA with 100 miles and running, run-in, I'm sorry, there's probably no G on the end of that. They, uh, they sampled, lowered the pitch of, and looped a two-second guitar chord from a Funkadelic song. And the court said that that was too much. And so they asked, uh, de minimis is the, the legal concept for too little to care about. That's the Latin, de minimis, Latin for too little to care about. And so they said, what would that be in this case? In music, what would be too little to care about? And the court said, as little as one note. Good luck with that. <laughs> uh, and so I highly recommend, you can get, Bound by Copyright is uh, CC license, so you can download it. And when Theft, A History of Music comes out, it will be too. And there are all sorts of fun jokes and, and cartoons. It's, a, it's an awesome read. I love it. And if, if you just need the sneak preview, we wrote a three-piece story about this. And the other reason that we talk about software is because it's cool. There's so many fun things happening with open hardware and software. And in a general circular way, uh, the top left is the humanoid, which is an open hardware project to build a bipedal robot. And if you've ever read anything about robotics, that's incredibly difficult, but perhaps could be done a lot more effectively with open source and collaboration. The next one is Sparkles, the soldering unicorn. Not necessarily approved by the fine folks at My Little Pony, but uh, she's out of, I think the Toronto hackerspace is famous for building Sparkles, the soldering unicorn. The next one is a touchscreen interface built by somebody who thought Minority Report should be true. Uh, these are shoes printed with the, the cool robot printer that I showed you before. This is the Open Moto X. Uh, I don't really know anything about motorbikes, but I bet it's an awesome open motorbike. This is an open source EEG machine to get back to the healthcare. The Beagle board, and then the last one is a cake I made of an Arduino board, because I think that's cool. 
Lastly, I wanted to tell you again about our webcast. Like we have the General Shelton webcast. All of them are archived. Uh, you, there's a little webcast link at the top of opensource.com so you can go listen to the old ones. But these are the next two we have coming out. June 22nd, we have Dan Pink, who um, wrote this book called Drive that came out a few months ago, New York Times bestseller. And he's going to be talking about motivation and how that affects the things we do. And then on July 7th, we are, I am so lucky uh, to have Todd Park, who is the CTO of Health and Human Services, and not CTO in the sense of I care about your computers, but the CTO in the sense of he's in charge of uh, Obama's call for open data in healthcare. And so he's the guy at the, the top of that chain, and he's an amazing guy to hear speak. He talks about how healthcare needs to follow the NOAA model, the National Oceanic, help me out, administration. I'm missing an A in there, weather data. What they've done with weather data and how many people are able to use that, he wants to be able to do with healthcare data. And so I'm really looking forward to having him on July 7th. You can register for, the, they're free, but you can register for the Daniel Pink webcast on the site now, and we'll have registration up for Todd Park soon. And this is how you can find us on assorted social media of your choice, or me. And that's about it. Thanks. Any questions? All right. Uh, there are not <laughs> Wow, now I really feel like a self-promoter. There are not instructions. There are not, it, it is the only of my not open cake. I do, I do post instructions for all the cakes and costumes and everything I make, except this one, as you can see from the picture, is in a book, and thus I cannot post it on the internet. But the book is called World of Geek Craft and has many other geeky projects in it. So you're welcome to check that out. Uh, it's, actually, it's not my book either, it's a friend's book. Uh, healthcare, really. Uh, I like to be alive is kind of what it comes down to. Uh, a lot of changes in healthcare. I, our insurance system is broken. The way we deal with doctors is broken. The way we take data from a doctor to another is broken. I, I mean, we're all, for the most part, young and probably relatively healthy people. And it's not very hard for me when I sit down at the doctor's office to fill out that form that asks me if I have had any of 700 conditions in my lifetime because they're pretty much all no's. But you reach a point where it's really hard to remember those things. And I'm reaching that point now as I have to remember them for me and two children and occasionally a husband. I can only imagine what happens when I get to be 60 or 70 and try to remember that for all of us. So there's a lot going on with electronic health records and the portability of that data and uh, how they can share it for, with one another. Uh, there's a really interesting thing going on that, that isn't, um, I guess successful is the word I'm looking for yet, but that isn't what I mean. Uh, a few years ago at Red Hat Summit, we had a keynote from Dr. John Halamka, who has far more titles than I could even begin to describe, but he's a CIO of Harvard Medical School, an advisor to several federal agencies, 73 other things I can't remember, and the last thing is, and a practicing emergency physician. Uh, and he has one of a number of implanted devices in his arm that at Beth Israel, uh, they are willing to implant you with. And all it has on it is a 16-digit number. It doesn't even have your name. It doesn't know anything about you. But if you come into Beth Israel, they will, it, unconscious, obviously, they will scan your arm to see if you have one. And if you do, that 16-digit number will be connected to your medical information. And so potentially, that is a huge change for, uh, you know, think of how many people come into a hospital unconscious on any given day. But then you're also hoping that people are willing to be implanted with a little 16-digit number and to have their data connected. So there are a lot of issues with privacy, and I think that's what makes healthcare one of the most interesting areas where we can apply openness, because there are so many complicating issues to figure out, but so much payoff when we do. What do you think is the most important thing to open? <laughs> it's okay, all I did was draw a portal cube and raise a question. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. I, uh,
So if you get somebody to print the parts for you, it only costs a couple hundred dollars for the other parts to complete it. It's really pretty cheap. Yeah, I've been thinking about getting one to carry around opensource.com booths because I, I'm still amazed at how many people haven't seen one yet and they're so cool. Um, so that's about it and for anybody who came by the booth and I said I would give you drink tickets or a t-shirt if you came, you can come obtain those now. Because <laughs> I have drink tickets left over from last night and t-shirts. About this. I can help with I like that. It. Help we it. have the same problem. What would happen if you did I this? You gave me a I good found idea. problem. How do you do that? It's like this. Well, I disagree with that. Really cool to follow that. Let's put the word out. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. OS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.